Hello and welcome to First Look, a Bible study looking ahead to the reading or readings for the coming Sunday. My name is Carl and it's good to have you with us. This week we're looking at a challenging passage which sometimes unhelpfully gets divided into two separate sections that really belongs together, in which Jesus critiques the religious experts of the day and praises a widow who gave all that she had left to the Jerusalem temple. Before we get started on our study, however, if you haven't done so already, you may find it helpful to download the sheet that accompanies it. You can find the link for that just below the video in YouTube. On the sheet, you will find the questions that we're going to be thinking about together later on, the text of our reading, some other passages you might wish to consult, and lots of space to record your own observations and thoughts. So without further ado, let's jump into today's passage, which comes from Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 38 to 44. We find Jesus in the midst of the Tuesday of Holy Week, teaching in the temple courtyard in Jerusalem. He's been involved in conflict with various of the key groups within Judaism of the day, with representatives of the Pharisees and the Herodians and the Sadducees and indeed the scribes. And he's just responded so powerfully to a question from one of the scribes in verses 38 to 44 of chapter 12, that we're told that nobody else dared ask him any more questions. He continued to teach in the temple courtyard and delighted the crowd through some of what he had to say about the scribes in verses 35 to 37. And our passage for today continues this teaching session in its first three verses and then moves on to some observations that Jesus shared with his disciples. So who have we got here in this text? Well, firstly and most obviously, we've got Jesus in the midst of Holy Week and thus the conclusion of his public ministry, teaching the crowds and his disciples. We've got the scribes, although there isn't a specific individual mentioned here, they are mentioned as a group. And these were people whose job it was to copy out legal documents and hence they became experts very often in the Jewish law and many of them belonged to one of the other principal factions within the lively Judaism of the day so many scribes were also Pharisees for instance. We know we've also got the disciples and the focus here is on the twelve who were with Jesus in the courtyard. We've got an unnamed widow what we do know about widows is in the deeply patriarchal society of the day, women who didn't have male relatives to support them economically and socially were very vulnerable. And it goes some way to explaining why this particular woman was so obviously impoverished. And finally, we've got huge crowds of people gathered to listen to Jesus's teaching and making their own contributions to the temporal treasury. And the temple grounds would have been much busier than usual because we were in the run up to Passover, one of the three great festivals where everybody who could would go up to the city for the celebrations. Now, we know that Mark's Gospel was the first to be written around 65 to 70 of the Common Era. And what we have here in this earliest Gospel are two stories exploring status and wealth. It's useful to step back a little bit, though, and look at some text from the Hebrew scriptures that can help us contextualise what's going on a bit more. So firstly, we have Deuteronomy 14, verses 28 and 29, which lists some of those who were vulnerable in Hebrew society, who needed protecting by the community, including aliens and orphans and widows. But interestingly, given what Jesus goes on to say here, including the Levites, the priests, they were considered to need the community's support because they'd given up everything to serve God. 
We've also got, as another bit of helpful background for us, 1 Kings 17, which is the story of another widow, focused in this case on God's provision for the poorest and neediest. And finally, we've got Psalm 146 and specifically verse 3. It talks about not putting our trust in mortals, in worldly rulers. And it's arguable that that is kind of being riffed on, if you will, in the first part of our passage for today. So said passage functions as a kind of two part drama with verses 38 to 40 forming the first act and 41 to 44 forming the second act. And there are some key and disturbing, quite frankly, connections between the two halves. And it's really important that we don't fall into the trap of going with some, the way some Bibles lay it out by putting a subheading before verse 41 and treating these as if they're two separate little pericopes. They very much belong together. And they give us the only two instances in the whole of Mark's gospel where the word chera, which means widow, is found. And yet what goes on here seems to continue an ongoing theme in Mark's gospel, which is that of Jesus's conflict with the scribes, his most determined opponents. So we'll come to Act 1 first, Jesus's condemnation of the scribes. He makes a sweeping statement about the scribes as a whole that condemns them effectively as being self-aggrandising and self-important. Things that were shown through their dress, their long robes, their demanding of attention and respect and honour in public places like market squares, and their seeking the best seats in worship and at feasts. And it kind of comes to a head with what Jesus says in verse 40, building on what he's just said in verses 38 and 39. The language here, some argue, is rather melodramatic. And he talks about the scribes both parading their piety through their lengthy prayers while devouring up widows' estates. And therefore, Jesus is basically saying, showing a lack of mercy to a vulnerable group. Now, the words that he uses for gobble up in verse 40 Speak, remind, reminds us of chapter 4, verse 4, where we have the birds gobbling up the gospel seed in the parable of the sower. The birds in this parable represent Satan. And Mark has a bit of a habit of giving us a verse here and a verse there and using a unique word to connect them. So if this idea of gobbling up is meant to connect those things, is Jesus comparing the scribes to Satan, to demonic forces? It seems an incredibly strong thing to say, especially as, as we saw in verses 28 to 34, one of the scribes who'd interacted with Jesus got what he was saying about the principal commandments and was described as being not far from the kingdom of God. But if we look back also to chapter 10, verse 35, where Jesus has talked about those who want to be first, needing to be the slaves of all, perhaps we can understand some of the judgment that is at work here. Though I do find myself wondering, given the scribes had a very particular role which demanded honour and respect, and given there was a mindset among at least some, that is arguably still present today, that equates material wealth with divine blessing, were they people who were really bad, nasty people? Or were they people who were caught up in a system, in a way of being, in a set of expectations that made it very hard for them to be the slave of all? I wonder how, if we looked at this little section from the perspective of that widow we hear about in verses 41 to 44, whether she would agree about the scribes being those who devour the estates, the houses of people like her. What we do know is that in contrast to what we're exploring really in 1 Kings 17, which is about God's provision for the most vulnerable, what we have here in the story of this widow is a real model of humble faithfulness. 
Following on as it does from what we've just heard about the scribes, it shines even more of an intense light on the ambiguities of systems and institutions, as well as revealing the demands of faithfulness. Now, Jesus doesn't accuse the rich people making large contributions, you hear about in verse 41, of making a show. But it's quite reasonable, given that this story follows on from what we've heard in verses 38 and 39, that that notion might well be in our minds. And certainly Jesus seems to suggest that their large contributions, although materially significant, don't have anything like the same value as the comparatively meagre, in material terms, contribution of the widow. When she approaches in verse 42 to make her contribution to the treasury coffers, it is with a humble, faithful dignity that draws our attention to the way the, the institution that she's supporting is one that Jesus has effectively said doesn't actually serve her interests. So there is a, an ambiguity and a tension here. But also I think it's important to acknowledge that people in her position, people who really didn't have very much in the way of material resources, did not have to make a contribution to the temple tre treasury. They weren't obliged to do so. So this woman chose to do that. And one could argue that saying, no, you shouldn't do that because these two copper coins represent the last of what you have, would be to deny this person their agency, their ability to make that decision for herself. So it gets very murky when we think about all of this stuff. And she's described by Jesus as giving more than the rich people who contributed large sums in verse 43 because she's given a higher proportion of her total wealth, as we hear in verse 44. She's come to see, in other words, that everything that she has belongs to God. And as one commentator helpfully put it, there's something very Christ-like about the widow, in that her worthless in material terms coins might well remind us of the worthless in worldly terms life of the wandering preacher Jesus and yet it's through that apparently worthless offering and indeed when Jesus is nailed to the cross and helpless that the fullness of God's love is made known and it's that through which salvation comes about. So perhaps what this widow does is to serve to remind us of that gospel paradox and I wonder if as the scribes looked on and saw people like this widow giving the last of what she had, whether they felt guilty or maybe they did think, hang on, this is an exploitative system. So there's a lot to wrestle with here, not just in the questions that we're going to be looking at now. I hope you find engaging with this passage during this week gives you a lot to think about. <laughs>